This podcast is brought to you with the help of listeners like you who choose to support the show via Patreon. A small recurring donation helps me to put the show together and I'm very grateful for those who contribute each month. For more information on how you can support the podcast, go to patreon.com slash ww2podcast. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash ww2podcast. Hello and welcome to another podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. In this episode, we're in the Pacific in 1942, looking at the exploits of Lieutenant Hugh Miller. I don't want to give too much away in the preamble, needless to say. It's a remarkable story of survival and one man's war against the Japanese. I'm joined by Stephen Harding. Stephen is a long-time journalist specialising in military affairs. He's written a number of books, including the New York Times bestseller, The Last Battle. His latest book, The Castaways War, tells the story of Hugh Miller and the subsequent events after the sinking of the USS Strong. Thanks for joining me. Let's start at the beginning Who was Hugh Miller and how did he end up in the Navy? Hugh Miller is what we might call a member of the Southern aristocracy. He was the son of a very well-known lawyer and one-time politician. Um, He grew up splitting his time between uh, the city and um, this plantation that his family owned. It was on the plantation that he learned to ride, to shoot, to track through through the woods at the hands of a family retainer that he referred to as Uncle Jim. Jim taught him pretty much everything there was to know about how to get along in the backwoods. So Hugh Miller grew up, uh, ended up going to the University of Alabama in the 30s, and he played on the uh, what's called the Crimson Tide. That's the University of Alabama's football team. He uh, played with the team when they played in the Rose Bowl in California, which is a a big college matchup. And he was well-established as an attorney um, as World War II was coming on in terms of the United States. Uh, It had been, World War II had been on in Europe, obviously, obviously since September of 1939. But Hugh Miller joined the Navy Reserve before Pearl Harbor. And once that attack by the Japanese took place, He managed to get himself transferred from being essentially um, an admin officer to uh, a billet aboard a new build destroyer, the USS Strong, a Fletcher-class destroyer. He really found his niche. I mean, he really had no naval background, so to speak, but he very quickly learned how to be a naval officer in wartime aboard ship, which, of course... Millions of other people were men, primarily, were learning to do in navies on on all sides of that conflict. Uh, there's a great uh, little quote in the in the book, "Lawyers on Destroyers," which amused me. I mean, you would have thought he would have been a, a straight in for an admin role, which would have given him greater advancement faster. So he pushed himself into the role, didn't he? Of uh, he he wanted to see active combat rather than a shore based assignment. He did. He did. He wanted to actually participate in in the war because even when before he went to sea as an admin officer, he worked in Florida. And I think people forget that German U-boats were sinking American ships in the Caribbean and off the east coast of the United States even before the United States entered the war in December 1941. So he was processing the reports of a lot of these sinkings, and he knew the sort of depredations that the, you know, the Germans were, were uh, carrying out uh, against American vessels. Now, of course, partially they were doing that because the United States was helping to escort convoys to, uh, to Britain even before we entered the war. But I think Hugh Miller saw the, the seriousness of the conflict. And like millions of other Americans, he wanted to do his bit. He wanted to actually participate in in the war out on the sharp end of the spear he wasn't a young well i said a young man <laughs> uh he was in his early 30s at this point as well it's not as if he was a 18 year old he, he was of a certain age um and and you have to understand angus and as, as i'm sure you do that in virtually every situation he found himself during world war ii he was often the oldest guy there 
there were only two people on the Destroyer Strong older than he was, the captain and, and the executive officer. And all of Hugh Miller's fellow lieutenants, because he was a lieutenant for most of the time he was on Strong, were you know easily 10 years younger than he was. And he was the uh, machine gun officer, wasn't he, on the Strong? He was, yes. And he was on duty on the uh, night of the 5th of July. So where was the Strong at that point, Strong was part of a uh, of an American task unit that entered Kula Gulf, which is a, a fairly large body of water separating uh, New Georgia Island from Kolombangara in the Solomons. And the mission of the task group that night was to bombard Japanese positions on Kolombangara uh, and on New Georgia. So Strong, the destroyer was uh, one of the two lead vessels. The American task group came in in single file, made sort of a large uh, U-shaped course that allowed them to bombard targets in, uh, both to the east and west. And Hugh Miller was on the flying bridge of the Strong. This is almost the highest elevation point on a Fletcher-class destroyer. It was actually just above the pilot house, uh, and he stationed himself up there because it gave him as the machine gun officer, the best observation point from which to, to both direct the 20 millimeter cannon um, that were under his command and also to spot incoming threats that might not have been located by the ship's air search or surface search radars. They're, they're spotted, aren't they, by an incoming Japanese uh, convoy? Yeah, there was a, um, a convoy of troop ships es escorted by, well, actually the the destroyers were escorting older destroyers that were carrying troops, and they were entering Kula Gulf just about the same time the Americans were from a different direction. And it just so happened that one of the Japanese ships, um, a destroyer, was one of the few Japanese naval vessels at that time that actually had radar. So it located the American vessels, and after some very quick, intense decision-making, the Japanese decided to turn around rather than continue on to Villa, which was a port on Kolombangara Island, which is where they were going to drop their troops and um, supplies. The Japanese commander decided to turn around, but as he did so, um, like any good sailor in any Navy, he decided to take a parting shot at the enemy. So he ordered those destroyers that had them to launch uh, these very lethal Japanese torpedoes. They were much more capable than American and British torpedoes of that period. So they kind of fired blindly, and it just so happened that one of them found strong. They were 11 miles away when they fired it. it it's incredible. Yeah, it was, it was what in, in later conflicts is kind of called a Hail Mary shot. You know, you just kind of put the weapons out there, but th these torpedoes were incredibly lethal and very long ranged and very fast. You're talking about a, a, a weapon that's zooming towards you underwater at 50 or 60 miles an hour. And there's that doesn't leave a whole lot of time to respond. No, it's, it's, it's absolutely, absolutely incredible. Uh, so the Strong's hit uh, quite catastrophically, isn't it? The uh, torpedo that hits it literally breaks the destroyer's back. It's a hell of a shot from a hell of a distance. <laughs> so they're, they're ordered to abandon ship. They are part of a flotilla, uh, which you know, is all sent in to pick up survivors. So uh, what happens to Miller? Hugh Miller goes into the water um, essentially uninjured. Right before the ship actually breaks in half and sinks, which, which happens fairly quickly after the torpedo hits, he had been sent around to check on various things, the welfare of people in certain parts of the forward part of the ship, to you know, sort of assess the damage for the ship's captain, uh, a commander named Wellings. And when it became obvious that, that the ship could not be saved, he was told to go into the water with everybody else, which he did, although uh, as the ship went down, he was, of course, uh, sort of drawn down into the water with a couple of sailors, whom he managed to rescue. They had been initially trapped by um, a, a foul uh, line that dragged them down. He was able to cut them loose. The problem arose when, as, as the ship sank, its own depth charges started going off when they reached a certain depth. 
And as I speak about it some length in the book, what followed was, was called an immersion blast injury, which is a fairly sort of nondescript term for a very serious injury. It killed a lot of people in the water, um, and it seriously injured Hugh Miller. I'd never heard of it. I mean, I wonder if you could explain what they are, what it is. As we all know, depth charges were developed uh, in World War I, basically, for surface ships to attack submerged submarines. And the way the weapon was used, it was, a, it was an explosive charge in what looked like a, a large trash can, uh, or dustbin, if you prefer. And when the thing went into the water, it had a, a gauge on it that registered a depth. That gauge was set before the, the depth charge was dropped from the surface vessel in the general area of the submerged submarine. And when the depth charge reaches a certain depth, it explodes. Well, by World War II, this, they were fairly sophisticated. And when a depth charge went off, the major way it would kill a submarine is by creating a shock wave that would move through the water at essentially miles per nanosecond. Um, this shock wave would expand at speeds of thousands of miles an hour. And the idea was the shock wave, when it hit the submerged vessel, would open its seams and thereby sink the ship or literally shake this submerged submarine apart destroy it through blast. Well, you can imagine that a weapon that's designed to do that is not going to be good for people who are near it if it goes off in the water because that same shock wave literally passes through a human body at, we're talking one twenty-five hundredth of a second. So if you're too close to the depth charge, and the same process works if you're near an aerial bomb that goes off in the water, the exploding weapon causes a shock wave that if you're too close, literally turns you into a mist or a jelly. Mm, it's all internal. Yeah. And, and if you're far enough away, you may survive the blast, but it still does horrific things to your insides, which is what happened to Hugh Miller. He's adrift. I mean, there's a lot, there is a lot of people in the water, though, though the rescue uh, by the fl flotilla was actually pretty good. A lot of them were actually picked up, weren't they? The, the majority of, of the crewmen of Strong were taken aboard other vessels, yes. But he's on a, it's, what is it? It's a floater net. Uh, it's a floating net. Floater nets were essentially just the big cargo nets we've all seen in, in newsreels, but they had flotation uh, devices attached to them, either big chunks of cork or or hollow cans, you know, that, that floated. And the, the idea was that they would allow something for, for men in the water to grab onto and keep them from actually sinking, but they were still at water level. I mean, you, you know, you're in the water on a net that just happens to be floating. It was certainly not a comfortable way to survive a sinking, but it, it was one way to survive. Yeah, the, and there's, there's, I think there's 23 of them on it, on it at, at one point. Yeah, the numbers, the numbers uh, when you think about how large these nets were, you're talking about a lot of men, most of whom were injured in some way or the other, clinging to a net that only has a certain amount of flotation. And the, the greater the number of people on it, the lower it's going to ride in the water. They must have been hellish. <laughs> yeah, plus, I, you know, I would imagine a lot of them are wondering how many sharks might be in the area. This was obviously a couple of years before we heard about some of the more serious sinkings where survivors were attacked by sharks. But anywhere in the Pacific, that would have been on people's minds. The, 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 I, it did strike me that the one saving grace is they are surrounded by islands. It's not as if they're in the middle of the Pacific. So you know, there is a, a hope of washing ashore, which is what did happen to them, didn't they? They did eventually wash ashore. They did. Uh, of course, that's, that's kind of a good news, bad news thing. The good news is there are islands around. The bad news is they're occupied by an, a really implacable enemy who even by that point in the war, had earned a reputation for, you know, extreme brutality towards prisoners. What options do they have? I mean, you know, giving themselves up would not be, was not an option. It was, I think, for some people. You know, one thing we might want to remember is that a lot of sailors, uh, Americans, British, Australian, New Zealanders, uh, and for that matter, Japanese, could not actually swim. They got some basic swimming training, you know, when they entered the whatever navy they were in. But a lot of these people were farm boys from 
Kansas or the outback of Australia or wherever. So the ocean was a very foreign thing to them. And other than sailing around on it in a warship, they, they really didn't spend a whole lot of time in the water. So suddenly your ship is gone, you're in the water, your, your first thought is, I need to get to land. So those who were lucky enough to actually get to one of these surrounding islands then faced a second problem. Most of them had never had to survive in, in what the military now calls uh, an austere environment without steady food supply or drinkable water. Um, so for some people that you know, washed ashore in the Pacific on these various islands and not yet knowing the, the full details of Japan's attitude towards prisoners, many of the people in, who found themselves in that situation during the Pacific War did surrender to the Japanese assuming that they would be treated under the uh, Geneva Conventions, they would receive humane treatment, which, of course, did not happen in, in virtually any cases of people taken prisoner by the Japanese. They're on this island. They have, essentially, they're, they're not prepared. They're, 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 I don't, the Navy, did the Navy give them any training at all for what happens in a hostile environment? Not by that point. Uh, this was, as we mentioned earlier, in July 1943, the Navy gave sailors new sailors, sort of rudimentary survival at sea training. It's like, okay, when you get into the raft, here's how you can fish, you know, for whatever you can catch and so on. But they really didn't give them any training about, okay, what happens if, if you wash ashore on land? Aviators got some of that because, of course, they ran a greater risk of being shot down over land. But for most American sailors, uh, and I would wager for Australians, Brits, New Zealanders, there wasn't a whole lot of training. So, in one sense, Hugh Miller's early life and, and you know, his tutoring by the, the gentleman he called Uncle Jim gave him a, a real advantage because he was far more at home in the woods, so to speak, than most people who would end up in that situation. Although, of course, when he initially landed on the island, he was very near death and, in fact, was convinced he was going to die soon. But what, you know, what was the course of action they decided upon? I mean, and, and Miller was the officer in charge, wasn't he? He was the only officer of the little group that, that finally made it ashore. He, the other men with him were uh, enlisted sailors. The first real decision that um, Hugh Miller made was to order these enlisted sailors to leave him because he... He was so severely injured, and the, the symptoms he was displaying were so convincingly catastrophic that he was certain he was going to be dead within hours, or, or certainly no longer than the next day. And he knew that these other sailors who were helping him were relatively uninjured, and he knew that if they stayed around to take care of him, they would likely all be captured by the Japanese, which was something that he would not have wanted to happen to them just because they were trying to care for him. So he ordered them to leave and he gave them, you know, his shoes and the knife that he had. And they, they were very, very reluctant, obviously, but ultimately he made it an order. He essentially said, this is not a suggestion, you know? Um, so they left him. I mean, do you know, other than divine intervention, do you, I mean, is there any medical reason why you sort of, because he, he perked up, he you know, he, he like laid out to die, as it were, and then it, it's almost like he was touched by the hand of God. Well, quite honestly, Hugh Miller himself believed that he had been. When when you read his accounts of what happened to him, and and of course I've I've read everything he wrote about the the you know this series of events, he was grievously injured. I mean, he he really should have died. And why he didn't, um, you probably either have to be a physician or a theologian to explain it. I, I, I think it was a combination of he was revived by a, um, a sort of a rainstorm that, that gave him fresh water. And I, I think the thing that really saved him, Angus, was the fact that he had been raised all of his life never to give up on anything. You know, he he was from a family that that emphasized personal responsibility and personal action. And I think ultimately, even if his wounds would have killed him at some point, 
I don't think he ever really would have given up until he took his last breath. I mean, this was a man who throughout his life had, had in a way, almost been trained for this one series of events. And his character and his and his religious beliefs, I think, had a lot to do with, with him deciding, you know, what's the Robert Burns thing about, I'm hurt, but I am not slain. You know, I'll, I'll lay me down and bleed a while, and then I'll rise and fight again. And that's, that's Hugh Miller right there. Uh, yeah, and this is really where it, 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 you know, the story starts to become quite remarkable, you know, uh, more than, <laughs> far more than the ordinary. What, you know, what does he decide to do next? after his semi-miracle recovery. His whole goal after he became mobile again, uh, which took, you know, several days, uh, obviously, when he realized that he was not going to die, he really only had two choices. He could surrender to the Japanese with whatever uh, outcome that might have, or he could do whatever he could to get himself rescued. Uh, And he did that. He you know, the first part of that was he had to stay alive. So he had to secure water. He still had some food left over. Plus he found, once he figured out how to open the coconuts, he had a fairly relative, uh, relatively plentiful food supply. And, and just as an aside, when I was writing this, this part of the book, what came to mind was the scene in, in the Tom Hanks movie, Castaway when he's trying to figure out how to open a coconut. I've done that. I've been on a South Pacific Island years before either the movie or this book. And I thought, I wonder how you open a coconut. <laughs> and it was one of the hardest things I ever had to do. And and I was on a, a fairly remote but not unpopulated island. I, I think I eventually smacked it between two rocks and I got the husk off. And of course, in trying to open the coconut, I completely destroyed it and all the, the milk ran out on the ground and stuff. So I, I, I really did identify with with his efforts to get into these coconuts. But once he did it, you know, coconut milk is incredibly nutritious. And people have survived only on coconut milk, Uh, although there are are certain physiological drawbacks, which we won't go into at this point. He decided that no matter what it took, he was going to survive and he was going to get himself rescued. And so everything he did was to forward that agenda. But it's up above that. He didn't just try to get rescued. He thinks he makes He decides to start his own war effort. Again, this goes back to the kind of person that Hugh Miller was. You know, he he saw himself as an American naval officer in a war zone. Because he had these skills as an outdoorsman, he wasn't, obviously he wasn't the best position to be in, but he wasn't at a loss. He was feeding himself, he was sheltering himself, he had fresh water, and he decided that until he got rescued, he was going to take the war to the Japanese. uh, Because that's what an allied officer or any Allied service member was expected to do whatever it took to take the war to the enemy. So that's what he did. And how does a castaway on an island with next to nothing and no boots take the war to the Japanese? Well, he uh, he was very lucky in several ways. He he managed because he was not the only American naval person in the vicinity. There were uh, American PT boats and American aircraft that were uh, also taking the war to the Japanese. So by carefully observing some of these offshore actions, he was able to supply himself with certain necessities um, by stripping the bodies of Japanese soldiers and sailors killed by Allied action. That's how he got a pair of boots. He got uh, bayonets. He got hand grenades. He got uh, some just barely palatable Japanese rations. You know, again, this is the the whole idea of self-reliance. And he was not a stranger to using whatever the environment gave him to survive. He he'd learned how to do that as as a as a teenager, essentially. So he was able to sort of beachcomb his way into food, certain lower level weapons. He, he wanted a, a working rifle because he was also quite a good shot, but that never actually worked out for him. But of course, he managed to make his skill as an American football player, you know, work for him by being able to chuck hand grenades quite a distance and very accurately. So he starts taking up machine gun emplacements. <laughs> it's what you're referring to. Yeah, he does. He, uh, you know, I mean, his, his goal uh, was both to not only take the war to the enemy, but 
he knew that that Allied forces would soon be invading Arundel Island, the, the, the island he'd landed on. He went out of his way to try and collect any intelligence information that might make that uh, landing safer for the troops who had to do it. So he essentially started observing the Japanese. And one of the things that really attracted me to the story, Angus, is that here you have a guy who should have by all rights not survived in the first place or who should have been quickly captured and executed by the Japanese. And yet he not only survives, he turns the tables on the Japanese. I, I just, you know, I mean, it's, it's like sort of the ultimate reality show premise. And yet it happened in 1943. The Japanese do become aware of him, though, don't they? They do. When, when you know, they start losing people to what they initially think are allied nighttime bombing raids. Uh, but then they figure out that, no, it's, it's got to be somebody on the island. They launch increasingly complex efforts to, to catch him. He manages to evade those with his, with his you know, back, back, backward skills. But he, he, he eventually does manage to get himself off the island. I mean, how does he manage to get himself picked up? He manages to attract the attention of an Allied pilot who is able to re relay the news of this red-haired, red-bearded castaway to the people who can undertake the rescue which they do under some very challenging um, circumstances. Uh, and he is ultimately returned to the safety, relative safety, of an American base on, on New Georgia, the island. From there begins sort of an odyssey that takes him, ultimately takes him home. But first he, he gets to meet Eleanor Roosevelt, the wife of President Franklin Roosevelt, and senior admirals and reporters and it's 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 really an extraordinary story especially for a relatively junior officer in the middle of the vast pacific war uh, which again is something that attracted me to that and then after the war and in fact even before the war ends his story attracts literally worldwide attention and there were many stories of world war ii that, that did that. Of course, John Kennedy's uh, experiences with PT-109 are among the, the better known. But Hugh Miller's story, especially in the 10 or 15 years right after the war, was a fairly well-known story that ultimately sort of faded from, from people's minds because it was overtaken by other larger stories. Well, it's one of those stories, that even, you know, as a kid in the 70s, you might be reading the comics, and the comics would often tell these stories and it's a story that i was quite surprised had faded away because he was a big celebrity at the time i mean there's hollywood movies almost in the offing and and it's you know it's just slipped from uh consciousness as it were and and again you know for me as a, as a writer that's one of the things i like to do i like to sort of bring back to people's attention these these wonderful very heroic stories in, in many cases. Uh, sometimes, as with my book about the last American killed in combat, they're very sad stories too. But because I think they, the, these stories from World War II have a universal and very current, they have current things to tell us, even in our modern 21st century, highly digitized world. Hugh Miller's sojourn on Arundel Island is really a story of human ability to overcome virtually insurmountable odds. It's an adventure story. Certainly, it's. I mean, I, I often describe it as you know, Robinson Crusoe meets the sands of Iwo Jima. It's not only a story about a castaway. It's it's a story about one human being's will to triumph over adversity that most of us would <laughs> wouldn't be able to deal with. And those are the kinds of stories from World War II and from other conflicts that can still speak to us as real human stories from which we can still learn lessons. I think the, ni the nice thing, the one thing about the World War II is often these people are everyman characters. They're not professional soldiers. They haven't been drilled you know, year upon year. They're usually someone either conscripted or they've chosen to do, to step in. And, and, and within very little training, they're thrust uh, into the most remarkable situations where many of them just shine like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> there was, uh, I think, a lot more 
need to improvise in World War II than we find in, in modern military operations. I mean, I've, I've covered conflicts in, in various parts of the world, and nowadays people have satellite phones, and they have GPS, and they have uh, robots and, and drones and all kinds of stuff. Although, of course, as we, as we also know, all of that technology can just go belly up in a, in a heartbeat and, and leave you back as if you were in World War I, let alone World War II. But people during World War II, although they were dealing with what was then cutting-edge technology, and we tend to forget that as we look back in history, that in, in World War II, the Fletcher-class destroyer was, when it appeared, a modern marvel of technology. It's only in retrospect that things seem sort of quaint and, oh, how could they have taken a ship like that to sea? So there was much more of a need for the people in World War II on all sides to sort of improvise, to use um, a level of ingenuity that, that sometimes is taken for granted in the modern world. I wonder if we could touch upon the Medal of He never got the Medal of Honor, did he? He never did, although I personally don't uh, exclude that as a possibility at some point. I... <laughs> go into some detail in the book about the various administrative and, and political issues surrounding the award of the Medal of Honor. And he, in my personal estimation, there, there is still a case for Hugh Miller to receive that honor posthumously, of course. But I, I think people will, be, will understand once they've read this section of the book, they'll understand why giving him the Medal of Honor at that particular point was an issue. Uh, and it, it probably wouldn't be today. Maybe so. Um, the, the Medal of Honor, just like the Victoria Cross, uh, comes with all sorts of political and, and uh, sort of baggage. I mean, it's a, it's, the Medal of Honor is the highest award for valor in combat that the United States is, uh, gives. And the award of it can be a very long and drawn out process, as we've seen. I mean, there there have recently been uh, both living and deceased veterans uh, of World War II who received the award from President Obama. So it's uh, it can be a very long and drawn out process. Do you think he should be given it posthumously? I think at the at the very least, his actions should be reexamined. And I flatter myself that this book presents a logical and unbiased look at the circumstances surrounding the events that might lead to his being awarded the Medal of Honor. Thank, thanks, Stephen. That, I've, I've very much enjoyed that. Um, if you, the listener, want to come up with your own opinion and if Hugh deserves to be presented the Medal of Honor, you can read of his exploits in The Castaways War. Stephen and I hardly scraped the surface of this man's incredible time on a Pacific island. I'll put a link to the book on the website. Don't forget you can show your support for the podcast at patreon.com forward slash WW2 podcast. I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening.